uh, I'm going to start over again. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Welcome. Uh, this is the first webinar of the Applied Evolutionary Epistemology Lab, APIL. My name is Antonio and I'm going to be your co-facilitator today. Uh, this is the first of a long series of webinars that we'll uh, go through this calendar year. And uh, the idea of the webinar itself came up uh, from a conversation that we are having with Natalie, catching up after um, some time. And um, we were discussing our recent developments and started starting thinking and, 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 and discussing the many challenges that we are facing um, in academia during the present uh, COVID-19 pandemic. And I decided to, I, to say, Natalie, why don't we organize uh, some, some Zoom meetings with the other RPL members? Uh, and here we are. Natalie agreed and with her usual enthusiasm, put up a fantastic calendar of talks in a few days. So I'm sure that these talks, they're going, they are going to um, inspire us and encourage us to build that much needed sense of community that, uh, that, uh, um, that is needed during these hard times. So for those that might not know APPEAL yet, we are a community of interdisciplinary researchers with expertise that span from critical theory to the uh, humanities and the social sciences uh, up to the biological and physical sciences. We are united by a common interest in evolutionary theory and um, its many applications in different areas of research. The name evolutionary epistemology itself refers to a current of interdisciplinary studies pioneered by psychologist Donald Campbell in the mid 60s. Uh, we aim to revive, continue and further develop this uh, long-standing non-mainstream tradition um, that has given many important contributions to the field of philosophy, naturalistic epistemology, but also to the social sciences and, and beyond. So a little bit of housekeeping before I pass it to uh, our founder and director, Natalie. Please uh, uh, write your questions on the chat box so that we can go over them after the talk to not interrupt the flow of, of, of the talk itself. Um, however, if you have an urgent question, feel free to interject. Uh, we might not have the time to accommodate all the questions, but uh, we will make sure that we take notes of them and we pass them uh, by email to the speakers after the event. Um, finally, um, uh, feel free to stay. Uh, we are going to try to arrange some, some uh, breakout rooms so that we can inter in interact with, uh, with, uh, with the speakers. Um, and feel free to stay a little bit more after the meeting to socialize and exchange a virtual, a virtual drink. Um, so without further ado, we are so excited to start this experience with you. Uh, now, Natalie, uh, our founder and director, will introduce our speakers. Thank you, Natalie. Well, thank you, Antonio, because it is really, uh, as he says, it is his idea. And, uh, and he, he had to push me a bit to do this because Appeal is, is not a conventional lab because most of the people that are part of the Applied Evolutionary Epistemology Lab are uh, not here with me in Lisbon. They are uh, at their own universities and uh, spread all over the world. So we have uh, uh, Antonio who is now in Canada. I am in Lisbon. And then we have members all over Europe and, and also uh, Australia, JT is there. Also in New Zealand is uh, uh, Andrew. Christina, for example, is most of the time in China. So it is, it is uh, difficult in many ways to, to get us together. But um, I think now with this pandemic, uh, this pandemic is teaching us things, not only bad, like to say something good about the pandemic. I think the pandemic is demonstrating that there are many ways for us to, to, to be together uh, virtually and, and uh, to organize meetings and, 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 and conferences, etc. Uh, also in a more ecological way, uh, because like, you know, just putting us all together in, in a conference room would, would require a lot of money and a lot of uh, flying and, and, and hotels, etc. While now, you know, we, we, we can do this. And so I have agreed with Antonio to do this and, and uh, to try this for one year to do these seminars and to see um, uh, uh, whether or not we would have an audience. But I think that the, the, the answer is already there in the first meeting yes we do we do have an audience so that makes me very happy and um, um, uh, very proud of, of, of uh, the fact that there is this interest in evolutionary epistemology 
and uh, everybody please be very welcome and so what we are going to do uh, because the the making of the program that was very easy you know that was like five minutes like we gave everybody from appeal that is a member of appeal uh, a month and we assigned them a month and then we we looked uh, what we are doing together and uh, how we can uh, uh, also invite other people that we are collaborating with and so we we have an overly full program for for uh the rest of the year we are planning to have meetings once a month in the middle of the month and so antonio is is uh, uh taking care of that and so uh the first meeting is is uh, dedicated to uh michael brady who is on the board of the Applied Evolutionary Epistemology Lab and who is one of the founding fathers of evolutionary epistemology. So it's like Antonio said, evolutionary epistemology was founded as a, a, a discipline by Donald Campbell in the 60s, but in 86, Mike Brady made a very important distinction between the AAM and AAT program. And today he's going to talk about a reinterpretation of uh, these two uh, uh, programs. And so, Without further ado, and with uh, uh, proud, I, I present to you Michael Brady, and I also want to thank you very kindly for being with us here today. Uh, well, thank you. Wait, no, how am I supposed to do this? First of all, I want to thank uh, both Natalie and Antonio for organizing what looked like in a very ambitious program in a very stressful environment in which we find ourselves, and thanks for inviting me to participate. And I hope everybody is uh, well and keeping safe and washing their hands, wearing masks and so on. Uh, let me see if I can get my program up here. Um, slide show. Okay, can everybody see that now? Yes. Perfect. Yes, okay. So um, let me um, share with you an outline. I wanna talk a little bit at the beginning about uh, some of my thinking about this uh, distinction. Uh, then I wanna shameless plug for something I've done and address the question about the distinctness of these program of this program, I mean, both Campbell and uh, Popper, of course, thought uh, there was no distinction there to be made and other people have said similar things. And then finally, I wanna say some, a few words about uh, what I take to be some of the implications for ontology. So um, the basic idea here is uh, that, um, well, anyway, the distinction was in, by me was inspired really by uh, Don Campbell's article in the Schilt volume on Popper that's been referred to. And I wondered um, to what extent the evolution of knowledge was as they thought, uh, Popper and uh, Campbell, a unified process driven by the same constraints and processes at both uh, the biological and intellectual level. And at the time it struck me as somewhat problematic in particular because the evidence that supports, I think a more or less Darwinian understanding of the evolution of biological mechanisms, epistemic mechanisms doesn't by itself, I think support an analogous understanding of the evolution of knowledge as codified in theories and the epistemic norms that warrant those theories. So as I indicated here, the EEM program, at least in my thinking, was intended to address issues in the evolution of the biological epistemic mechanisms, the sensory organs, brains, and the like that uh, enabled uh, knowers to come into being in the, in the world. Whereas the EET program was intended to address issues in the evolution of scientific knowledge and I had something along the lines of Popper's well-known model of conjectures and refutations as an exemplar. And I should point out that the, that model, Popper's model, can be understood in either of two ways, uh, either descriptively or normatively. And both readings have been subjected to much criticism. 
I mean, people have argued that it's not a correct description of the evolution of knowledge and um, it doesn't really serve as a normative, um, a normative gate that determines what is or is not, what is or is not knowledge. Um, that said, at the time I wasn't careful to distinguish, which I think I should have, between knowledge as codified in theories and the underlying warrants, the epistemic norms that legitimize claims to knowledge. But it seems to me obvious, at least, that the evolution of such norms, although an aspect of EET investigations, is not necessarily driven by the same considerations that drive the evolution of knowledge claims. So I'm considering possibly partitioning EET into two sub-programs, EETK, which talks about the evolution or deals with the evolution of the knowledge corpus, and EETN, which uh, addresses questions about the evolution of epistemic norms. And I want to, focusing just for a minute on the question of the evolution of epistemic norms, it's clear that these have changed over time. Uh, just consider, for example, the contrast between Plato and Aristotle on the one hand and Popper or 20th century analytic philosophers on the other. Um, the big question to which I don't have an answer is this, is the shift in epistemic norms over time indicative of um, what I wanna call an evolutionary shift driven by selective mechanisms or some other processes or is it just one thing after another? People just decide they want to adopt certain standards and reject other standards that they've held in the past. So the idea of selective forces at work here, and I must say, I haven't really thought about this in any great depth, strikes me as very problematic. From a Kuhnian perspective, for example, insofar as epistemic norms are one element of what he called disciplinary matrices, it's not clear that an evolutionary story can be told here. But there's some story to be told, and I'm gonna leave it as an open question as to how we should answer it. Uh, now the shameless plug, <laughs> and I, this is a sort of a digression a little bit. I wanna focus attention on the fact that epistemology, like ethics, is a normative discipline. And at the time, I was struck by the fact that, well, evolutionary epistemology was considered, uh, at least in some quarters, to be a respectable discipline. Evolutionary ethics was given short shrift by almost everyone. And I led, led me to propose an analogous distinction between um, EEM and EMT, the evolution of EEM, the evolution of moral mechanisms, that is the brain and other sensory processes that enable people to both behave ethically and to make moral judgments, and EMT, the evolution of moral theories or principles. Uh, what's traditionally understood as evolutionary ethics. And again, it seems to me more or less obvious that the evolution of the biological structures that underlie and enable a generation of moral sentiments can be understood from a broadly Darwinian perspective. And equally obvious, I think, that um, the evolution of uh, moral thinking uh, can't be so understood. But um, as I said, I want to leave this uh, distinction for another day, and here's the shameless plug. Um, I wrote a book about this uh, called The Secret Chain, Evolution and Ethics, came out in 1994, um, which addressed uh, some of these issues, uh, looking at uh, Darwin and his, the influences on Darwin and so on, and some of the subsequent attempts to uh, promote evolutionary ethics at what I would call the EM T level. All right, that said, I want to 
look at the question about the distinctness of this program, these two, uh, the original programs. Um, as I said, the original idea was that with respect to EEM issues, more or less straightforward Darwinian selectionist story could in principle be told. Now, our current thinking, I think, is that this story is complicated by the relevance of other mechanisms, such as those brought to light by Evo, Devo, Eco considerations. In addition, I think there's the possibility that core elements of the underlying biological mechanisms might not have been selected for their epistemic utility as such, but such features uh, were in fact byproducts of the emergence of structures selected for other functions. Now, if any of these things are true, it complicates uh, laying out in detail, in any cogent detail, uh, the actual story of this evolution, which is complicated again uh, by the fact that uh, these mechanisms are in brains and it's difficult to uh, examine fossilized brains if any such exist. Um, in any case, it seems to me clear that the evolution of the knowledge corpus per se is not driven primarily by the selective pressures that drive the evolution of the underlying mechanisms, which I take it are primarily uh, driven in part by um, the physical environment or what I'm calling physical reality with the reality and scare quotes. And I'll try to motivate the scare quotes uh, in a minute. Now, to the extent that uh, the selection model does apply to the issues raised by EET sub D, or K, I guess I called it, I want to suggest that the select relevant selecting environment, selection environment, is at least in large part a social and cultural environment and not the physical environment. And I don't want to, I can't argue for this detail now, but I just want to suggest that when when scientists or when people test hypotheses, they're really testing hypotheses against a body of accepted facts. And these facts are not the physical world, the naked physical world as it were, but are a socially constructed story that people tell based on their interactions with, uh, with the physical environment. So it's the, the, the direct selecting of the direct selection pressures on theories, it seems to me, is a, an environment of facts and data as opposed to uh, the physical world. Um, now the question is, even given that, it must be admitted that there are clear cases of cultural factors, for example, influencing the evolution of biological substrates and it would be an interesting project to tease out exactly if, how, and to what extent cultural and social factors influence the evolution of the underlying epistemic mechanisms. And again, I'm leaving this as an open question. I don't really have anything uh, particularly interesting to say about it, although I think it's worth uh, thinking about. Um, so turning to the last part here, um, implications for ontology. So I wanna draw your attention to uh, three realist models of the evolution of knowledge. Um, one is um, uh, Charles Sanders Pierce, Peirce, who was of course influenced by uh, Darwinian thinking in the 19th century. And very roughly, uh, Peirce's view is that uh, the truth is what we will find at what he called the end of inquiry, or what we would find if we were able to explore all options. And this is presumably a description of the world, quote, as it really is. Um, secondly, there's Popper's notorious uh, 
model a series of conjectures of refutations, which um, converges on a theory or a true picture of the external world, converging to a realist position. And finally, there's Campbell's variation on Popper's view, which is again that uh, the end of inquiry, as it were, um, will result in a, uh, a a story that is basically um, a picture or a theory, or a set of descriptions of a of a real entity, a, a real world. And I want to suggest that these are all variations. Well, I'm not going to suggest that they are all variations of what's often called scientific realism. And they these in particular all share um, what I'm going to call um, the uniqueness hypothesis. And the uniqueness hypothesis basically is a claim that at the end of inquiry, there's going to be a unique description of, of the real. Now, while I am uh, sympathetic to the methodological commitments of these views, I'm suspicious of the ontological commitment that underlies the uniqueness hypothesis. So what I wanna do in uh, the few remaining minutes here of my talk is to propose what I call, what I take to be a pragmatic alternative. And I won't argue for it in detail here, but we'll offer, I wanna offer two considerations that, uh, that ground my suspicions of this. Um, and the first one deals with the question of reality. Um, when I was younger, I used to worry about real reality <laughs> and whether I was a realist or an idealist or what sort of ist I was. And um, there are so many different alternative ways of understanding this problem or this distinction um, that at some point I sort of came to the understanding that not much really turned on which way one went with respect to this issue. But that said, very crudely, the real, what is, what is it to be real here? <laughs> and it's often characterized as that which exists independently of knowing observers. And if this means that you just can't make everything up out of whole cloth or that not anything goes, I think that much is right. Facts are facts, despite what some of my friends in America think, and the truth matters. That said, however, there are clearly socially constructed cultural institutions and processes. For example, banking systems and legal systems, which would not exist if knowing observers did not exist. And they are clearly real as anyone who has faced uh, bankruptcy will clearly or surely admit. But, In addition, I think one can plausibly argue that the elements depicted and described by physical theories are social constructions as well. Now, when I say this in my classes, my students get into an uproar, but before anyone flies into a frenzy about this, at the suggestion, for example, that atoms or fields are social constructions, um, note that while just because something is a social construction does not mean it is not real as the socially constructed uh, institutions are, uh, illustrate, not all con social constructions are created equal. Some are acceptable and others are not. And the validity of the reality of atoms and fields is attested to, I would claim, 
by the status of the theories which purport to characterize them. And the test of those theories is producing other theories which show how the original theories either do or do not take care of all the things we think they need to take care of. So how does one determine which constructions are acceptable and which are not? And the answer is the epistemic norms, of course. And since I think we can be reasonably assured that there are no such thing, that there is no such thing as a platonic form of epistemic norms, this seems to me to preclude the idea that there is or could be a unique end of inquiry in the sense in which it is usually understood. Because we're in a kind of co-evolutionary gambit here. As the knowledge increases, the norms, um, sorry, as knowledge evolves, the norms evolve along with them. And finally, there's something which I'll call Natalie's gambit. And uh, the second reason for being suspicious here of the uniqueness hypothesis was first made clear to me by Natalie's notion of species specific realities. There's a certain anthropomorphic chauvinism, seems to me, about the view that human inquiry is the master key to determining the nature of the real. It seems eminently plausible that different organisms with different sensory modalities and different epistemic capacities for processing and evaluating their environments live to a certain extent in different realities. Now, when I first read this in Natalie's, one of Natalie's papers a couple of years ago, I thought this is a crazy idea. Uh, but as I began to think about it, it seemed more plausible to me. And as a matter of fact, I just yesterday wanted to uh, refresh my memory about Campbell's paper. And I realized just skimming through Campbell's paper that there's something like this in Campbell's uh, paper as well, except at the realist that he is, he thinks that um, it's obvious that there's gonna be a synthesis of all of these different alternatives into one uh, unique picture at some point. But given the uh, fact that these different organisms have different sensory modalities, modalities and different epistemic capacities for processing and, evalu and evaluating their environments, uh, whether, they, whether these different realities can be ultimately synthesized into one coherent picture is I think at best a fervent hope for some, but not something we can glibly take for granted. And I'm not exactly sure uh, what sort of arguments can ultimately be addressed one way or another to resolve this question. But uh, the conclusion is not that we ought to be scientific realists or uh, what I'm calling a pragmatic realists, but that uh, the question, the ontological issues really, it seems to me, drop out of the picture. I don't see that they really play any uh, important or interesting role in determining uh, what we think we know and what we think we don't know. Um, so with that, I'm gonna bring this short uh, talk to an end. And the basic idea is that the coevolution of knowledge and epistemic norms is um, strong reason for doubting the existence of a real world in scare quotes, which we would counterfactually discover at the end of inquiry if such an end uh, could in fact be reached. And in fact, I think if you think about the evolutionary consequences of uh, what we're thinking about here, that the very idea of an end of inquiry as usually understood seems suspect because there's always that option of uh, modifying the epistemic norms that determine what it is or is not that we think we understand. And um, with that, 
Thank you very much. And uh, that's the end of my talk. I don't know whether there was, that was half an hour or not, but that's Thank it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Michael. Thank you. Very, very inspiring. Lots, lots of, lots of things to, to think about. Um, so I will open to the questions. Um, feel free to uh, raise your hand with the option here. Um, Zoom option to raise the hand and uh, you can just simply speak. Go ahead, Johal. Hi, uh, thank you for your talk. Um, Hello, thanks. I, I want to challenge you on uh, good. exactly why uh, you consider evolutionary epistemology to be better off than evolutionary ethics. How is it such more <laughs> respectable, and in particular, uh, how can it perhaps being its biggest challenge, how can it explain normativity? Uh, uh, okay, that's, yeah. Um, all right, so there are two, two, two parts of this. First, why did I think it was had a respectability that evolutionary ethics didn't? And the main reason was um, that uh, uh, nobody seemed to be attacking uh, Popper and uh, Campbell in the same way that people who advanced theories of evolutionary um, ethics seem to be. But that said, um, if you read, again, if you go back and take a look at uh, what Campbell thought he was doing, uh, is he made a distinction between uh, descriptive epistemology and normative epistemology. And he thought, he thought what he was talking about was um, the evolution of uh, knowledge as Popper understood it, leaving the epistemic part, uh, leaving the normative part to one side. And, and so he didn't think that he was, that this account was explaining the evolution of normativity. Um, and I worried about, I worried, I did worry about this, um, but, um, now I'm having to dredge up what I, what I thought 20 or 30 years ago. Um, but in the 80s and 90s, I wrote a series of papers uh, trying to address this issue. And um, one of the, well, one of the distinctions I think I made in the original paper was um, three different ways of thinking about the relationship of evolutionary epistemology to traditional epistemology. One, the traditional epistemology, one of the answers that traditional epistemologists gave was that evolutionary epistemology wasn't epistemology for exactly the kind of reason you're suggesting. It didn't deal with the normativity part. Um, the other part, the other answer was Campbell's response that uh, evolutionary epistemology dealt with the descriptive aspect, but not the normative aspect. And uh, the third alternative was something like um, uh, evolutionary epistemology was a successor discipline in the sense that uh, the old normative issues would uh, give rise to, um, would, would fall away once the evolutionary picture was, was uh, laid out in full. And in the, I think you to mean, a certain extent, Quine, Quine has this view, sorry. Uh, Quine had this view. And um, I tried to argue that um, the normativity sort of, well, I don't know what to say, disappears, not really, but uh, it somehow gets, gets handled by by uh, by the by the uh, by the evolutionary epistemology approach. That's not really a good answer. So, uh, yeah. So, um, would that would that solution be in line with eliminativism? Or would would the normativity be just I don't know, like folk concepts of? Uh, um, psychology and just 
Well, yeah, in, in so insofar as Quine thought epistemological problems were really psychological problems, yeah, I think so. But I but I agree with you. It's a, and I've, I've written other papers where I've tried to address the question of normativity because it it does bother me about where where these where this idea of normativity comes from, and. Um, as far as I can see, and again, I'm not an expert in ethics, or I don't really do ethics, and or have any really deep insights into the nature of normativity. But uh, it strikes me as that many normative theorists seem to think, I think they seem to think that there is a kind of platonic there's a correct God-given way of thinking about what, um, what are or are not the proper ways to evaluate um, either moral actions on the one hand or epistemic claims on the other. And I just, that view leaves me cold. Not that I have a really satisfactory answer one way or another as an alternative. But. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Uh, thank you, Joao. Um, any other questions? Dennis has a question. Dennis, yes. Go Would ahead. You go ahead. Yes. Um, I'm fascinated, um, Mike, by the distinctions between EEM and EET. And I wonder whether part of the fuzziness here, if there is fuzziness between the two, was in one of your points, which was, I think, a bit of a throwaway in your talk, the extent to which culture influences biology. Now, I want really to make a point rather than a question. And the point is that if we're going to attack that question, and I hope very much we do in these seminars, then it's going to be very important to, to distinguish what type of biology we're talking about, because the biology of Darwin and the biology of the modern synthesis are not the same, and very particularly not in precisely this respect, what I've got in mind here is that Darwin certainly thought that animals have conscious intentions and can choose. And that is that's active selection, not passive natural selection. The neo-Darwinists, of course, and in the modern synthesis version, tend to deny precisely that. Uh, and of course, it depends how extreme the neo-Darwinists you're talking about. And I, I recognize that. But however one might classify the different forms of neo-Darwinism and of Darwinism, the fact that there is this very strong contrast between the original Darwinian view that there was over and above natural selection, processes of active choice by organisms, which incidentally Popper also uh, largely championed in his Meadow Lecture in 1986, Right. does mean that we've got to distinguish between whether we're talking about the Darwinian view of bio biology or the neo-Darwinian of biology. Seems to me they, they whatever else we, follows from this, they are very significantly different in relation to precisely this question, does culture influence biology? Um, yes, I think I, yeah, I agree with, everything you say there. And I think another complicating factor, at least on my understanding of Darwin's thinking here is, um, I mean, if you remember that uh, the, the origin and the descent of man were written before the distinction between um, genotypes and phenotypes is made. And so, there's a lot of stuff in Darwin where um, I think the 
biological evolution, evolution at the biological level and evolution at the cultural level um, are treated really um, as one and the same or variations of the same idea. And my, my, my point about, I, I'm not sure, so that said, I'm not sure that um, Well, two points. How and to what extent, what the relationship between culture and biology is, that's a, that's a question. And how we're to understand cultural evolution and biocultural evolution. I, I, yes, I agree. Those are really um, uh, interesting and deep, deep issues. But the, the, the nature, the fact that, that organisms may or may not make intentional choices, which are selection choices, it seems to me that's a complication that doesn't really address, unless I misunderstood your point, that doesn't really address the distinction between EEM and EET because the intentional actions of organisms which uh, one might attribute to the psychological dispositions or epistemic dispositions to make certain kinds of, reasons. I think those are all part of what happened. I lost contact with everybody. Um, no, you don't, you didn't, we, we hear you fine. Yeah. Oh, I, I don't know, something. Anyway, the, the, uh, the psychological activities that in, are involved or the psychological dispositions that are involved in, in making uh, intentional decisions or acting and so on. So I think that all belongs on the EET side. That's not really part of the, uh, what I'm understanding is the biological mechanisms, although clearly there are psychological mechanisms, but they're they're part of the, uh, um, what, what could I say, the phenotype of the underlying uh, uh, gene, genic and biological basis, at least on my understanding. Just a brief follow up, and yeah. perhaps park this, because I think we'll almost certainly want to come back to this kind of question at some stage. I mean, is a, is a peahen in choosing the beauty of the peacock, not mm. uh, developing a cultural phenomenon in the biological evolution. I, I, it's a, of course, it's a classic example. Uh, right. Well, all right, but, but what complicates even more questions like that once we bring up peahens is the extent to which animal culture is culture as we understand, I mean, indeed. how yeah. do we understand culture is a big pr problem on its own, but whether animal culture and human culture are more than, more than just mere analogies or metaphors is another, is another big can of worms as it were. <laughs> so I don't, yeah, I agree though, those, those things need to be sorted out. <laughs> Also, if I can interject, uh, the di distinction of, between sexual selection and natural selection that was already uh, pointed out by Darwin himself, right? The two processes. That Sorry, do... the difference between sexual selection and 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 oh, yeah, sexual, yeah, right. in general, right? It was pointed out by Darwin himself. So that's also something to take into account. Yeah. By the way. Thank you so much. Uh, do we have uh, some more time for one last question maybe? And uh, Joe Velikovsky, do you wanna go on? Thank you, Antonio, and thank you, Mike, for your talk, great talk. Um, I had a question. I did hear you say a moment ago, a minute ago, you don't profess to be an expert on ethics but I have an ethics question. That's if I heard you right. Yes. When we talk, and, and Dennis, and we were just talking about animal culture, of course, 
when somebody asks me how to explain evolutionary ethics, am I right to say for non-human animals, I would probably look up evolutionary game theory, such as John Maynard Smith, but for human animals, I would look up some of the books that have been written on it or are being written on it because some of the rules are different for animal culture and ethics compared to humans. Do you uh, so, agree with that distinction? Yeah, so I, I take it you mean by, by the, <laughs> excuse me. I take it you mean by the appeal to game theory <clears throat> that we don't have to think about um, the internal workings of the animals. We're just looking at their uh, behavioral uh, consequences and behavioral activities. Yeah, well, again, this is, this is a tricky issue. Um, I had a colleague, um, some of you may be familiar with his work, Jak Panksepp, who did a lot of work on emotions in animals. And his, his lifetime argument was that the failure of, I mean, most people think that attributing feelings and emotions to uh, animals, uh, non-human animals is anthropomorphism, a bad thing. And Panksepp's view was that if you look at the evolution homologies between the brain structures of animals and humans that um, it was a mistake not to attribute certain <laughs> fundamental feelings. And then, then the question is, can you attribute ethics in a real sense to animals, in, sorry, in, in a, in a human-like sense to animals, although with limitations? And um, if you think about uh, the behaviors of various uh, organisms, uh, like wolf packs, for example, and other groups that, that chimpanzee groups and so on that show various uh, seemingly cultural decisions about what to allow and what not to allow and who to, who to commune with and who not to commune with. And you combine that with Yock's view that there's some neuroscientific basis for thinking that there's an underlying that these animals are not just behaving as a Cartesian might think, but are actually feeling things, that there is a, a kind of line that one could um, stretch to include animal ethics as a legitimate, not merely uh, something to be described uh, uh, through a game theoric, game theoretic mechanism. In fact, I've written a paper on that. I don't ask me where it is. <laughs> oh, well, it I do know where it is. It's there's a volume uh, edited by uh, Ray Fry, um, and um, can't remember who else uh, called. Um, well, I can send. I'll send it. To, I'll send the reference to you. Um, and I'd like to hear what you think about it. By the way, I read the paper you sent me. And I've got some. I'll send you some remarks about that as well. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Mark. Yeah. Thank you all. Thank you so much for your questions. Uh, it was very inspired. A lot of things, obviously. You know, the 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 the, the, the communication could continue on and on. Um, uh, do we want to proceed with our next speaker, Natalie? Yeah, can, I, can I ask you a question to Mike or, or a comment to, can, can I do that? Go ahead, please. You're the chief, uh, you can do whatever you like. <laughs> no, 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 the chief is Antonio. Antonio is the chief of, of the meetings. Go chief. Uh, Thank you very much, Mike. And also, um, you know, I know when I when I uh, first uh, uh, wrote to you about species specific biorealities, you really called me crazy. <laughs> and but like, you know, I'm, I'm happy that you're turning to, to towards the, the possibility of that idea. 
And, um, you know, also like thinking about it and also being in relation to what Denny said about uh, uh, animal cultures and what you said about niche construction, I would even wonder if it is possible to um, talk about some kind of coherence even within a species specific by reality. Like I think even on an individual level, um, there is not always a coherence in the reality that is formed by uh, the individual, I think, because um, you know there are so many different ways of constructing the world in the mind, in, 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 in touch, in sense, in, in, there are so many ways of being in the world that I think that um, there is not necessarily coherence in, in that regard too, but I don't know like if, if that is perhaps even more crazy, uh, what would you think about that? Uh, well, I'm not sure what you mean by lack of coherence here. You mean that each individual animal has its own uh, reality? Each, each individual organism? Or? Sorry, I, I, my internet connection is unstable. <laughs> OK, uh, so I didn't hear you. I'm sorry. No, I, so I'm not, I wasn't clear about what you meant by not coherent. You mean there's no sort of unified uh, wolf view of the universe? Is that the idea? Well, yeah. So you refer to Campbell, and for example, he, he was not ready to give up the idea that there was not uh, one world out there. And yeah. also, even I think until until Franz Wickettitz, he, he, he uh, 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 introduced this idea that there is some kind of a coherence and that there is some kind of... of uh, I would say mental resonance, but he too also didn't want to give up the idea that there is a world as it is in itself. Now, I think with the idea of biorealities and the recognition that different animals have different cultures and that they construct different niches, the idea is pushed forward that there are different biorealities. But there too, uh, and so there is no, 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 no uh, coherence with one world as it would be in itself. In, instead, that one world is a pluralistic uh, uh, realm of different biorealities. But then there even, I think still uh, at, at an individual level, not only in, in association with species and animal cultures or specific animal cultures, even in an individual level, I don't know if we can actually think about some kind of uh, coherent reality that a person is in. Um, like for example, like, you know, like, uh, even as an individual human being, the way that you are in one country in, as opposed to how you would be in another country is already, I think, a, a different form of, of being and a different reality that is being brought forth that does not necessarily, I think, have any coherence with, with a world in a different country. I don't know if I'm, I'm making uh, uh, myself clear in what I'm trying to say. Yeah, I think I see where you're going here mm -hmm. you're stretching the bounds of my <laughs> not calling your ideas crazy here <laughs> but <laughs> there's got there's got to be um i don't know really have much deep to say here but there's got to be some sense in which um even though you're in portugal and i'm in america we're living in the same world because we are communicating now that said, uh, certainly, and I don't know how to tease this out. I mean, clearly we have different uh, slants on what's important and so on and so forth. And what's uh, the social ambience, different social ambiences we live in uh, uh, are clearly different. Now, what that, how that translates into um, realities, at least as I'm thinking, I think you're trying to understand them, and I don't know, but it's certainly worth thinking more deeply about. That's about all I can say. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all. Very, very inspiring. Very interesting. Um, so, um, Natalie, do you want to proceed with our next introducing our next next speaker? Yes, Anton, are you ready? Where I, I don't see you here. Uh, okay, ah, let me here see. you are. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. 
So the next speaker is Anton Sukoverkov. I, I hope I pronounced that well. And Anton and I, we met at uh, the biosemiotics meeting in uh, Moscow in, I think, already two or three years ago. And so we've been uh, uh, in contact ever since. Um, and and uh, Antonio uh, Anton, uh, excuse me, Anton invited me uh, to write with him uh, this paper that he's going to talk about, about uh, evolution above the organismal level. And so Anton, please uh, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Let me share with you my screen. Uh, can you see my screen? Started? Yes. yes. Okay, good. Uh, so everyone expressed gratitude to Natalie and uh, Antonio, but in my uh, presentation, I will criticize Natalie uh, for being just humble genius. So she has many ideas, but most of, uh, most of them she leaves behind uh, and go further. Uh, but I want to discuss one idea that I think very seminal and prolif prolific. It's idea of offspring effect in evolution. So I will uh, tell a few words, few ideas about our uh, uh, article that we wrote together. And then I will focus only this offspring effect uh, because I think it's a kind of new idea that we need to elaborate further to, to, to contribute more efforts because all reviewers of our article uh, asked us to, to give us more examples of this offspring effect. And I will uh, give these examples, uh, maybe my hypothesis uh, about this uh, uh, offspring effect. So, as Natalie said, uh, we wrote article about non-genetic inheritance, evolution above the organismal level. And um, there we discuss the idea that became very common nowadays, that evolution um, and inheritance happens not only by genes alone. We have epigenetic, behavioral, symbolic, ecological inheritance. and. Uh, but still those who realize this, who uh, follow extended evolutionary synthesis, they still um, focus on organismal level. They focus on uh, physiological traits and pay this attention to other traits. Uh, for example, cognitive one or behavioral one. Uh, for example, if we take a human nature as example, uh, there are two approaches to understand human nature. Uh, Bottom-up approach, uh, think that human beings and their unique cognitive abilities originated from internal changes. Uh, for example, genetic mutations. And top-down approach, think that human nature depends on and uh, mediated by society. And newborn child needs external social, ecological scaffoldings uh, to become human, like chicken needs a hand incubation to hatch. So uh, I uh, think that uh, top-down approach more effective uh, because examples of feral or wild children taught us that uh, to be born human doesn't mean to be human. You need society that gives you software uh, that makes you a, a human. So human nature is nested in society and the better is developed society, the better is developed human nature. So uh, in our article, we um, proposed uh, to, to move from physiological to behavioral cultural traits. And uh, for example, we take for granted such traits as um, um, washing hands or cooking food or doing morning exercises we think this is kind of natural, but actually these cultural traits that play biological function, they increase our uh, chances of survival. Uh, uh, today we discuss, do animals have a culture and what is a culture? So any, uh, animals, I think uh, that they have a culture and they could 
pick up some human traits. Uh, for example, they could smoke, uh, they could learn how to smoke, they could uh, learn how to type 100. Um, and uh, along with non-physiological traits, uh, we, with Natalie, proposed the uh, idea of community or system traits or organizational traits. Uh, these traits are um, trans-individual and uh, transgenerational. And uh, uh, we define community traits as heritable phenomena that occur at and above the organismal uh, level. Uh, for example, for example, uh, these uh, um, penguins, they uh, adapt to environment, not by genetic mutation, they create a kind of social thermoregulation. And this adaptation is organizational uh, and it, it doesn't need any genetic mutation or physiological changes. Uh, Natalie also gave uh, many other examples in her articles. Uh, we, uh, we know that uh, uh, microbial system, ants colonies, symbiotic association, human societies, they have these synergetic properties or organizational properties that can be reduced to uh, individuals that, uh, const uh, that construct this uh, system. So another example uh, of trans individual traits, this bridge that ants create, uh, this bridge uh, looks like a solid construction, but actually they replace each other because they cannot hold it for a long time. So it's kind of trans individual uh, system, adaptational system. Uh, human uh, journey to Mars is an example of transgenerational uh, journey that goes beyond individual boundaries. So it's also a feature of the human society that requires uh, more than one generation to complete. So uh, this is a basic idea of our article. Now, now let's focus on offspring effect or reverse inheritance. From Boyd and Richardson, we know that there are three di direction of cultural tra uh, trait transmission. Uh, there is a vertical one from parents to offspring, horizontal from peer to peer, and oblique from teacher or mentor to a student. Uh, scientists who uh, work in extended evolutionary synthesis, they use also idea of parental, parental effect. Uh, parental effect uh, is any effect parents may have on the phenotype of their offspring over and above direct genetic transmission. For example, baby koalas, uh, they eat their mother's poo because it contains bacteria that allows koala to digest toxic and fibrous uh, eucalyptus leaf. Without this uh, ecological inheritance, uh, this baby koala will die out because they don't have uh, genetically this bacteria in their guts. So uh, parental effect is example of vertical transmission from parents to offspring. Uh, but uh, with Natalie, we think there is a also offspring effect. It's kind of opposite effect. Uh, offspring effect we define as behavioral and cultural effect that children may have on their, tra uh, on their traits of their parents or grandparents. And Natalie gave example of uh, grandchildren who teach their grandparents how to use computer. So uh, grandparents, they want to stay with, uh, stay in contact with their grandchildren and they learn uh, how to use WhatsApp or uh, Instagram. So they give kind of social affordances or scaffoldings for the, uh, for the skills. And, um, and that's, uh, that's only example that we have in our article. And as I said, uh, reviewers ask us to give more examples to show us that this offspring effect is real uh, fact in, and it plays some role in evolution. 
So I came uh, with few ideas. Uh, this just hypothesis, uh, but if you have other ideas about offspring effect, you can send uh, your ideas to me or to Natalie Gantier, and we could uh, develop this idea further. So my first um, uh, hypothesis, my first uh, example is uh, neoteny. Uh, uh, but first, let's uh, discuss uh, what is a recapitulation theory. Maybe you heard about uh, about it, uh, or you know it. No. According to the theory, ontogeny uh, recapitulates some stages in phylogeny, and this uh, theory was applied both to biological and social system. Uh, however, um, uh, we can find opposite process when ontogeny reverses phylogeny. Uh, today I invited Amadeo Viana. Yeah, I don't know how to pronounce it. I hope at the end of this of my presentation uh, he will comment. Uh, he will uh, tell us some ideas uh, from his articles. I think uh, it is very interesting and uh, could uh, benefit, uh, could give a new insight for uh, for evolutionary development, uh, uh, for evolutionary epistemology. So in his article uh, called uh, The Unfolding of Language as Hysteron Proteron, he uh, said uh, that in case of human brain development, we could see that ontogeny reverses phylogeny. Uh, since late postnatal brain growth, quite recent in evolution, launches in ontogeny before the phylogenetically all process of playing and learning take place during the childhood and youth. So uh, as I understood, uh, uh, so he used a, a, a feature, a feature of speech uh, called uh, hysteron proton in which uh, last thing go first. It's called uh, Yoda speak. Uh, patience, you must have my young Padawan. And, um, uh, his idea is that uh, because uh, human um, child, uh, human babies have uh, extended yaws, uh, they uh, uh, they receive ability to learn uh, or to open possibilities for new uh, new direction of development. In his article, it is uh, uh, language capacity. So, um, because we have uh, we have this uh, postnatal brain growth fast and this ex uh, extended uh, extended use, uh, this opened um, possibility for a new direction in development, and therefore I think that uh, neo neoteny, uh, this ability of the retention of juvenile features uh, till uh, adulthood, uh, could be another example of offspring effect. And the scientists say that uh, the emphasis on learned rather than inherited behavior requires that human brain to remain re uh, receptive much longer. Uh, therefore, neoteny has been a key feature in human evolution. So we could say that last stages in evolution, uh, for example, human baby become kind of first stage in evolution in a new direction of evolution. The, uh, therefore, we could say that uh, uh, it is not just biological um, or social system inheritance, scaffold development of its individual individuals, but particular individuals could also give a new direction for the development of the whole system by the invention or discoveries. Uh, therefore, top-down system regulation inheritance is accompanied with innovative bottom-up development from individuals. So we can see kind of reversion all the time. Society uh, create the human beings and be human beings create society. Uh, so there is a reverse uh, causation or reciprocal causation in development and uh, in evolution. So uh, another example is um, of offspring effects uh, I found in quantum physics. Uh, uh, it is cutting edge of current studies in quantum physics, retrocausality. Uh, uh, retrocausality is a concept of 
cause and effect in which an effect precedes the cause in time and so a later event affects an earlier one. So you can Google uh, this radar causality in quantum physics and you will be surprised uh, how many um, controvers uh, controversy we have. So it's still uh, uh, it's new uh, new discovery in quantum physics. It's still uh, unknown for for us, uh, but scientists only started to do research in this field. But I think that in uh, biology we could find something an uh, to find analogy. So I think uh, uh, we need to apply for. Uh, for studies of biological systems, not only <clears throat> classical approach that past influence the present and future, we need to apply to biological system also uh, tele, uh, teleonomy, tele, teleonomy. Uh, because uh, a living system uh, are a future directed system, and we could explain the behavior of uh, uh, biological system or social system from the future. So past and present could depend on future. Uh, so I think that this uh, could be another example how um, later stages in evolution could determine uh, earlier stages in evolution. And finally, third example that we can use, um, it is, um, reinterpretation of history and reinterpretation of DNA. Uh, in my country, we have a joke that Russia is a country with unpredictable history. Uh, idea is that any new government kind of reread or reinterpret uh, the history and bad, uh, bad guy becomes a good one and good one becomes a bad guy. Um, so it means that uh, it, uh, we, we, it is not just transmitted, history is not just transmitted from previous to new generation. It is uh, reinterpreted, reread by new generation. So it kind of historical spring effect. Uh, in biology, I think we also could find this theory in evolution of development biology. Uh, they uh, gave many example against preformationism Preformationism, and uh, uh, and uh, I think also interest uh, another interesting theory is alternative splicing. It also gives uh, uh, more um, variety, more flexibility in evolution. So I think that uh, we, in case of uh, DNA, we also uh, can see that it is reinterpreted each time when it is started to, uh, with, when organisms started uh, starting to develop. Uh, that's it, that's all I want to say. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Anton. Thank you, thank you for your, mm -hmm. for your interesting, very interesting and inspiring talk as well. Um, so we're gonna open it to questions. Are there any questions? I think uh, Isabella. I think Isabella. Isabella has yes, I can see Isabella. Um, please, Isabella, yes. mute yourself. Oh. Yes, go ahead. Thank you very much for this talk. Um, I'm I'm sorry that I don't turn on the camera, but I think I've got a, a quite unstable internet connection, so I try to avoid not being kicked out. Um, so I, I very much like the idea you came, you two came up with, um, and uh, one of uh, the concept that immediately comes to mind is that uh, humans as we are collective breeders shortened our um, this intergenerational uh, uh, breeding time so females can have much more offspring than um, our closest relatives primate relatives uh, and at the same time biologically uh, human females uh, undergo a menopause. So what I would claim that fits kind of in your picture that because um, human females care, did more offspring, they took, uh, the, the, um, contributed to raising the offspring, 
at some point, there was a biological effect from bringing up the offsprings in the adults because at some point, biologically, females at a certain age could not reproduce any longer. So I would claim that there we have an influence from uh, the offspring to the parent. I don't know if I made myself clear. Mm. So uh, how so uh, need of reproduction uh, created yeah. menopause? Yeah, menopause. Exactly. Mm. So the reason why. Um, females that I think that is a very solid hypothesis by now yeah. um, the reason why why fem human females undergo menopause is because they contribute to raising the offspring right mm -hmm. so uh, and that is something that is very unique for for humans so there is a direct causation from the infant to the offspring mm -hmm. however no, uh, uh, sorry to the to the um Adult, however, not to the parents, but to the grandparents, this grandmother hypothesis. Yeah, that's mm. my comment. Uh, wh why grandmother? Because it, ah, grandmother, yes, exactly. Yeah. Because uh, she don't take more responsibility, yes? Exactly. Uh, mm, mm, I see. Yeah, that, that, uh, that's just my two cents. Mm. But it is interesting, I heard this theory that uh, most talented uh, talented uh, scientists uh, were brought up, uh, were, were educated by their grandmother and grandparents. So <laughs> it's, yes, it's interesting that if they stop to give a babies, so they more can give more energy and efforts exactly. on the grandchildren, yeah? Exactly. Oh, so that, that's what I would claim that here comes this re reciprocal causality, which you're, you're pointing mm -hmm. towards. Mm. Hmm, interesting, interesting. Can you give us some link uh, to yes, this? Yes, uh, okay. I, I sent some to Natalie, yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah, great, great, thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Um, there is another question from Amadeo. Do you want to go ahead? Yeah, Amadeo. Hi, thank you. Thank you for your talk. Anton, I, I have just uh, um, two comments. I well, start with one comment about uh, backwards effect. Uh, mm -hmm. Just thinking about um, Darwinian Darwinian theory, um, I, I am I always think about the fact that, um, for example, um, artificial selection was prior. Artificial selection was made by men. It's, it's a kind of thing made by human, and uh, somehow society starts with a, a artificial selection, selecting for the best, the best animals to take care of, and or everything. So artificial selection was prior. Then we have Darwinian theories, and we discover on this on this basis on this ground uh, natural selection. And then the whole history changes. All our history changes. So it's a it's typical backward effect uh, in the sense that we, you were talking about. Uh, uh, what do you think? I mean, th th this is just a comment. This is not a I question. So I a kind of backward effect oh, uh, oh. with natural selection it changes the whole history of the whole history of the man. And we don't say, okay, selection is not made by men but selection is made, made by nature, nature. Mm. So we focus on nature. And this, this changes the whole history. Even this changes the whole status of what natural sciences were. So in mm. some sense, uh, natural sciences are quite different after Darwin and after physics and, and all that. So backward selection involves also history of science and the way we consider mm previous concept. Uh, this is one comment just for you then. Have a second comment but later. Okay, I see, I see. So, uh, yeah, your point is that uh, we kind of uh, move, move back and forth in our um, mental, mental um, procedures, yeah? We, 
reinterpret, re reinterpret the past from the point of uh, current discussion, uh, current discoveries. Yeah. Yes. Um, yes. Uh, okay. That, that's one. That's a point, an interesting point because you were talking about um, the discoveries, so the creativity, how creativity can change even our future. But uh, so I would say creativity, so it change is is also changing our past because it changes also uh, the very history of man. So the very uh, our presuppositions about the history of man. Think about uh, dinosaurs or so the Jurassic mm -hmm. times and things like that. So we have a whole different idea now because we know much more things. Uh, that's that's in this sense. If this history affects us. Uh, that's one thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we discover more in the past uh, when we discover more in the present. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, well, one, this is one of the points. And the, and the sec my second comment, uh, I'm, I'm not sure, perhaps it's related to the, to the first comment. I, I'm not sure. But the, my, my second comment is related to the question of uh, uh, inverted recapitulation. So, uh, first of all, I think I, I'm not very much, uh, I know, I don't know very much about bio biology, but I think that uh, inverted recapitulation is not so a strange phenomenon. So it's, it's very common in biology in the sense that uh, when you consider uh, the history of individuals, the history of individuals, some changes for the species occur in uh, at one moment in the, in the time scale and some changes uh, can occur later in the time scale, but before in the individual development. That's what, what we call uh, inverted um, inverted recapitulation. I mean, there's a very common fact in, in biology, but perhaps related to human species and related to human development of language, that's a, a special import because uh, the idea that we have developed first uh, in the time in times um, capacities that we develop later in individuals or for example uh, playing football or playing with playing with the balls or playing with branches or the kind of activity that children usually do these are um, facts that probably came first came first in the in evolution that uh, articulated languages which is much more recent evolution. So this is the inverted recapitulation. And uh, and the Sorry, issue Amadeo, for me is Amadeo, the, Amadeo, uh, finishing the question for me is just situating the, the the different levels on the scale of the individual for individuals. Yeah. So I like your idea about football. Can you explain it more clear? So what came first football or players, yeah? Is it problem? Who came first, football players or football? Is it right? Did I get you right? Uh, uh, I didn't understand. I didn't get your question really. So, so. you said um, you gave an example with football, yeah? Uh, yeah. Because, so, because, uh, recapitulation, but I didn't get uh, why football is a good example. Uh, what came uh, first? Um, mm, yeah, um, I was thinking about uh, physical activities related to play. For mm -hmm. example, the activity of playing. Uh, um, playing was, in some sense, playing is common with um, with our ancestors. Um, they play before they talk, and yeah, it's like for uh, another better example could be uh, laughing, and smiling, laughing mm -hmm. and smiling, which are previous. Uh, to to our to, to come to Homo sapiens and more developed stages of, of evolution because they were yeah they, they were common in other species in juvenile uh, or in young part of the and yeah the, the, and the young animals uh, and the question that you mentioned about the long um, time for us to learn. Uh, as related to to children evolution, I mean we have a long time to learn, and that's what what I why I talked about football, about soccer, and plays and games and, and so on, which are very which we as children love very much. 
get mm. So the, the, the question of reversal is interesting. It's, it's always in there, but it's a very common biological phenomenon. So something that we have, a, uh, for example, at eight years, something that could have developed long uh, before uh, um, individuals develop. So that, that, that's interesting. Uh, there's mm -hmm. a reversal again. Uh, in your article, you also mentioned this correlation between individual uh, linguistic capacity and social uh, capacity linguistic, because you can learn uh, a language from other people, uh, but to learn it, you need to have this uh, capacity. Uh, and there is a kind of circular causality between uh, language, uh, society, and indivi individuals. So you need society to learn language, but society need individuals who know how to use languages. And the same is true about football. It's kind of problem who created football. Uh, football created football players or football players created football. Uh, so maybe in future we, we also, in other conversation, we could address this problem because uh, it's, um, I think it's, also relates to this uh, reverse causality when element impacts the system and system uh, system process impact individual development uh, and they mm, rotate kind of rotate yeah yes thank you thank you thank you very you, much thank you yeah so do you uh, joined us yeah model i'm very grateful yeah thank you you for thank you for inviting me so much thank you so much everyone um, any other questions before, maybe we have uh, time for another for another question, um, but before, if, is there, okay, uh, yeah, you go ahead, Natalie, please. Thank you very much, uh, Anton, also for this very interesting talk. And it's true, the referee said that we had to give more uh, examples of the offspring effect. Also, I must say, uh, I gave that example, but it was Anton who, who gave the name of the offspring effect. He, he does not do enough justice to himself and, and his contribution there. Um, but um, Yes, the referees ask us to give more examples, but I think any kind of, of uh, social cultural learning uh, that involves learning from uh, an older generation to a younger generation can already be uh, uh, a form of, uh, uh, sorry, from a younger generation to an older generation can already be a form of an offspring effect. So in that regard, we would just be listing any kind of social cultural learning that exists. On the other hand, um, um, there is indeed, and this is also something that we have been discussing, but that we didn't publish on, there is this, this question of retrocausation. And I think that retrocausation is uh, in many ways bigger than the offspring effect. Yes. Um, and I think that we should uh, treat that perhaps as a standalone issue. Um, and I think that, that uh, uh, as such, the offspring effect would perhaps be an example of retrocausation, but I think retrocausation is bigger than itself. So that's another point that I wanted to say. And that's also why, why uh, I like very much that you go there. Um, I also think that it is virgin territory. I also think it's a bit dangerous and it's also a bit complicated to go there because how do you start thinking about it? You know, it's like quantum physics, we, we, we have to go there. We have Dennis here, perhaps he can give us uh, some, some uh, ideas also because of his ideas on, on relativity. Um, so that is uh, another point that I wanna say that is I think uh, something that needs to be developed more, but that is uh, independent, I think, in a way of the offspring effect. And then a third point that I wanted to raise is these stages and these ideas of terminal uh, addition and then a turning towards that. And in general, uh, and, and perhaps that is because of my background in anthropology, I don't like the idea that there are these stages in evolution because then people start to think that they are necessary stages and that um, uh, is also something that we saw, for example, with Hackel when he started to talk about evolution and terminal uh, addition and the idea that ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. 
then you get the idea that you have uh, uh, individuals or biological species or sometimes cultures when it is applied in cultural evolution theory that there are groups that are stuck in time or that are underdeveloped and that is something that i i do not want to endorse i do not believe in and so that is something these stages i think that is something to look out for and to to avoid as much as possible that said, of course, if you look, for example, uh, uh, in, uh, at development, and if you look at uh, the homeobox genes uh, complex, for example, that is indeed true that there is this, this fixed part in the genome that, that uh, causes for a similar developmental uh, uh, staging, if you want to use that word, of, of uh, body plans in fruit flies, in humans, in mouse, uh, and all of that. So there is some kind of, of phases there. Um, but then that already is, is something more uh, associated with genetic research and all that also uh, uh, takes it away from something like the offspring effect. Mm. So that is, yeah. is uh, my, my, my other point there. Yeah, we, we need to clarify it's a, a new field and we we can uh, make it more clear yes uh, for us and for others yeah, yeah. but I'll still i think yeah sorry cannot, sorry yeah that we cannot explain evolution only just uh, by random mutation so i think uh, we need more than random mutation for in case of uh, a case of uh, retrocausality, I think we could connect retrocausality with a teleonomic system. I think that evolution partly, uh, partly is directed uh, in some way. I don't know uh, which way, but <laughs> uh, but I'm sure it's not a, it's not directed by genetic mutations. It's a, a living system more more uh, determinant that we 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 think. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, any other questions? I think Olha wants to make a comment. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Anton. Uh, it's, it's actually in addition ended up being to what Natalie said, um, my humble knowledge of um, evolutionary biology <laughs> um, in, in recent readings suggests that we really there is no this idea that we should take recapitulation as literal right so we don't expect to actually all stages in phylogeny be um, recapitulated in ontogeny and that's when we look at ontogeny we cannot infer this is how processes happened and i always tell my students uh, when we talk about language i say when we look at language development in a child we cannot assume that this is how language developed in our ancestors right that they started differentiating for example speech sounds and using some gestures before they started using words, and then you know, sometime later, syntax appeared. Not necessarily. Mm -hmm. um, the genetic uh, toolkit suggests that it's it's not the necessarily the gene sequence, but but rather time of evolvement of certain structures that differentiates us in different species. So morphology, that variety of traits that we have is coming from similar structures, but they are expressed and they develop differently over the lifespan in different species. This is what we see um, at the level of morphology. And I think applying this to cognitive and linguistic level and you know, to level of cultural evolution um, probably also makes sense. So it's, it's not that necessarily we recapitulating phylogeny, but rather it probably tells us about where the selection was on what features and why, you know, in, in us it was like this and in other non-human primates, for example, it was differently. Um, in terms of um, system formation, actually in evolution, you might, um, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Peter Anohin's work. So system yeah, genesis, yeah. he precisely talks about this, mm. um, something just for for inspiration. <laughs> Sorry, which uh, which book? Uh, Peter uh, Peter Anohin, he he worked on system genesis, system genesis, mm, mm. and his grand grandson. Speaking of uh, offspring effect, uh, Konstantin yeah. Anohin, he's a neuroscientist now. He yes, he yes. kind of continues this work. Mm. I it's can send you some of the 
information um, and some papers on it. It's strange. I don't know if it helps you. It does it helps to solve for my problem. Uh, when I started to um, study Chinese language, I was surprised how um, children's uh, little children's language is similar with Chinese language. Gaga, Dada. So the name of the sisters and brothers is Dada Gaga. So it's uh, similar to to Chinese language. Maybe we should uh, take as um, all these languages to analyze the origin of language, not a new one like a Russian language. Maybe Chinese language could be kind of proto language for analysis of uh, origin of human language. I don't know. <laughs> so I'm just thinking about how which language we could use to recapit uh, recapitulate the past of the language to re restore the past of the language. Maybe Chinese is closer to all these all this, uh, languages, to earliest languages. Uh, I don't know. Uh, one, okay. one, one, one little answer uh, about this. Uh, as far as we know, um, to tonal languages were my, much more common in the past. That's the only thing we could say. We could not say that some languages or Chinese is the prototype or something like that. But as far as we know, tonal the capacities were much more common. That's the only thing that language uh, would dare to say. Can you uh, specify what tonal means? Sorry? Can you specify a little bit better, clarify what tonal means? Yeah, tonal uh, languages are languages that use to tones. We usually in European languages use tone to mark uh, pragmatic effects, for example, a question or that you are angry or emotional effects or something like that. But in tonal languages, languages with use tones like Chinese, which are very poor more for, uh, phonetically, I mean, the, for the point of view of the series of phonemes, uh, they are, they're very poor. They are very rich in, phon in tonal in tones. So they use tones, uh, it's like in tones in music, okay, in different, different tonalities in music, pitch, the pitch and some tones uh, mounting and down, go, going down. So five, usually five tones. So they use tones for grammar to distinguish between words. So that's a question that we don't we don't do. For example, for example, take, take an example we use we every everybody understand that it's a kind of pragmatic effect between yes and yes, or even uh, different types of, of saying yes in English. Yeah. So this is tonal. Okay, these differences are a little bit morphological, but mainly tonal. Yes, you so say in a low tone. Sorry, Mateo, tonal language is better for studies of uh, origin of the, for searching of uh, proto language. Yes, it's more closer uh, to. Uh, yes? the, there was an old idea about the, the, the development of languages uh, in the line of what Natalie has said about recapitulation. So, mm -hmm. in the sense that there were languages much more developed than others. But uh, besides this old this question, which has a even a racist impact or whatever you can call it. Yeah, besides this fact, we can identify some. Uh, this is one of the problem I, I used to look for. We can identify some phon phonetic, syntactic, and morphological features that are um, older than others. For example, mm. tones. Tones are old, and they were much more, much more tones in languages, for example, Latin was tonal and much more languages. Uh, also languages tend to uh, lose tones. So there are many languages that have, they have, for example, even Sanskrit, Sanskrit have tones in the past, they have lost tones. So mm. that means that tone uh, was a kind of, uh, uh, was, was important. This is related to a kind of uh, music or something like that. We don't know which. It's yes. just a hypothesis. But uh, to, as far as tones are, of, and even the same for some phonemes, some strange phonemes that we don't use uh, um, usually. They're they're 
few languages that you did they, they represent that they are very very old uh, like product something that you can make with your lips or with your tongue that we we don't use it for grammar where you disagree with somebody we can you can say something like that is very difficult in this but uh, something like uh, clicking your your tongue or something like that so this is used for grammar in an african languages so this is very old that's that's the only thing we know so there are some that is the, the, the can make these stages without the prejudices uh, that we mm, used to attribute to mm, uh, to the history of language. So they are not better well to be old is not to be better or worse so it's something it's just to be older as a point we see thank you <laughs> thank you all right. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, I think we uh, we're gonna we can we, everyone is welcome to say a little bit more. We're gonna have an informal chat. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna say thank you so much, everyone, for participating. Uh, I just want to remember that we are gonna have a calendar of talks coming up next month. Uh, we are still defining the dates, but uh, as I said and Natalie said already, uh, we are. We are aiming at the middle of the month, and um, so I hope to see you again next month and continuing our our um, you know growing up together and and creating this community together. Thank you so much, everyone. Natalie. Actually, now Thank that uh, Dennis and David are are here, uh, maybe we can we can we can uh, finalize the date if that would be possible for for Dennis and David. It uh, I think you were discussing the nineteenth, right? And they already told me on the email that uh, that's a good day for them. Yes. Okay. So. Hi. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So the next meeting will be uh, February the nineteenth. Nineteenth. Okay. Yeah. Okay. February nineteenth. Okay. So I will Perfect. add it to the website. Okay. And it's also at five. Is it also at five? Uh, it's gonna be at five. Yes, exactly. Okay. Okay. So that's five Lisbon easy. time. Five Lisbon, Lisbon time. time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Lisbon time is our it was the time reference. <laughs> okay, that's fine. Okay. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Thank Maybe you. We Thank can, you very much. We can take uh, if we want. We can take a screenshot. Maybe that we can post post on the. Um, um, I want to visualize collective. 